history lecture by Professor Gertrude Himmelfarb entitled From Hegel to Marx. It's sponsored by the American Enterprise Institute. Himmelfarb is Professor Emeritus of History at the City University of New York. She is described as the foremost historian of Victorian England in the U.S. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Chris DeMuth. I'm president of the American Enterprise Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here this afternoon for the May lecture in the Institute's Bradley Lecture Series. <clears throat> AEI's research is concerned primarily with immediate uh, issues of domestic and foreign policy and American politics, but we recognize, indeed we insist, that the policy debates of the day do not take place in a vacuum but are deeply influenced for good or for ill by general ideas. For example, by ideas concerning individual responsibilities and rights, concerning the relationship of the individual to the community, and concerning the appropriate role of the state. This monthly lecture series, titled Ideas and Consequences, and made possible by a generous grant from the Bradley Foundation of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, is devoted to exploring some of the major ideas that have shaped Western civilization and that continue to shape our actions today. It's a great privilege to have as our lecturer today Gertrude Himmelfarb, who is Distinguished Professor of History Emeritus at the Graduate School of the City University of New York. She is a graduate of Brooklyn College and of the University of Chicago. Her field is intellectual history, and I think it is fair to say that she is America's preeminent historian of ideas. Her articles have appeared in leading English, English language uh, scholarly journals for four decades. She has received over a dozen major academic awards and honorary degrees, and she is a member of the American Philosophical Society and other honorary learned societies. Her books include searching studies of the thought of Lord Acton, Charles Darwin, John Stuart Mill, and she is perhaps best known for her studies of the Victorian era, Victorian minds, the idea of poverty, England in the early industrial age, and marriage and morals among the Victorians. Her most recent book is The New History and the Old, published by Harvard University Press in 1987, uh, concerning which uh, Merle Rubin of the Christian Science Monitor said, it is emphatic, polemical, cogently argumentative, and very close to the kind of discourse that Himmelfarb finds sorely lacking in the discipline of history as practiced today. She is currently working on a further book concerning the idea of uh, poverty, uh, uh, following on uh, her book, The Idea of Poverty, uh, published in 1984. The subject of her lecture this afternoon is uh, From Hegel to Marx. Following her lecture, as is our custom, there will be questions and a general discussion, and then a reception in the next room. Gertrude Himmelfarb. Thank you, Chris. Uh, can I be heard? Among the other events no one was able to foresee, right up there with the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe, was the arrival of Hegel in Washington. First by courtesy of Frank Fukuyama, who, Frank Fukuyama, who introduced us to the idea of the end of history, and then by the president of Czechoslovakia, who informed a joint session of Congress that recent events had proved the truth of the proposition, consciousness precedes being. Uh, he didn't explain this rather cryptic remark. He certainly didn't give the source of it. But he did follow it up, and he received a round of applause when he did by adding, and not the other way around as Marx claimed. Uh, and not the other way around. I'm going to take my cue from uh, President um, uh, uh, Havel, I am going to turn around the subject of my, of my uh, talk so that it reads not from Hegel to Marx, but from Marx to Hegel. 
Uh, as a historian with a compulsive regard for chronology, I don't make this change lightly. Uh, I arrange even my, the novels on my bookshelves in chronological order. But I think it's important to make this change, to reverse the chronology, because it's only by reversing it that one truly understands, I think, the present status of both thinkers, of both uh, Hegel uh, and Marx. Uh, one understands why it is that both Fukuyama and Havel seem to agree that Hegel has finally belatedly triumphed over Marx. One also, I think, can understand what Marxism is like in the world today, and particularly in the academic world today. It's not the Marxism that you and I may have known. It is something that one might call neo-Marxism. It is uh, Marxism, I think it was Gilas who first used the phrase, Marxism with a human face. It is, in effect, a Hegelianized Marxism. And it's that Marxism, it's in that form, uh, that Marxism has been able to uh, persist, to survive, at least in American universities, uh, long after the real Marx uh, has been, uh, Marxism has been discredited. One of the curious things about this reversal of chronology from Marx to Hegel is that we were first alerted to it by another East European, a Hungarian this time, uh, over half a century ago. The early Marx was discovered, or rather invented, which makes it very much more interesting, by George Lukács in 1923. This was 40 years after Marx's death and some 25 or more years after Engels' death. Except for Engels, none of the major commentators on Marx, neither Kautsky, nor Bernstein, nor Plachanov, nor Lenin, nor Trotsky, ever knew, had ever read, or even knew of the existence of this early Marx. Uh, the Marx that now looms so large in Marxist literature, the Marx of uh, the economic and philosophic manuscripts of uh, 1844 and of the German ideology of 1845. They didn't know about these writings because for the very good reason that they had never been published, not even in Marx's youth. A few years after Marx's death, Engels wrote a long review of a book on Feuerbach to which he appended two pages of an early manuscript by Marx, uh, as I say, it, it, from a book, from a 600-page book, which he didn't even bother to identify by name. It was, in fact, the German ideology. These two pages were called The Theses on Feuerbach, now very famous in Marxist literature. And they were the only pages, Engels said, that were worthy of salvaging from this very long manuscript. Uh, the manuscript, the, the book as a whole, he said he and Marx had willingly abandoned to the gnawings of the mice. And it later turned out when we discovered the manuscript that in fact uh, the mice had consumed a uh, fair uh, portion of those pages. When a Russian comrade suggested publishing Marx's early writings, Engels brusquely replied, then Marx had also written poetry as a youth, and surely no one was interested in that now. Besides, he added, quote, to penetrate into that old story, one needed to have an interest in Hegel himself, which was not the case with anybody now. After the Russian Revolution, the Marx-Engels archives were turned over by the German Communist Party to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. In 1927, a prospectus of the collected works of Marx and Engels was published, including a brief abstract of these early writings by Marx. In 1932, the first volume of this edition uh, appeared, and it included some of those early writings. Now, the intriguing part of this story is the fact that several years before the publication of the prospectus, let alone of the uh, books themselves, Lukács, a Marxist who was also a philosopher, published a collection of his own essays called History and Class Consciousness, which made something of a stir at the time and has become a kind of cult book 
among uh, Marxists and radicals today. Lukács knew nothing of Marx's early writings, but he did know, as everyone did, that Marx had read and studied Hegel. And on the basis of that fact alone, reading back from Marx to Hegel, he deduced that Marx's ideas were more Hegelian than anyone had suspected. That, for example, Marx's uh, theory of exploitation, which Marx meant to be a purely economic theory, in fact derived from Hegel's metaphysical idea of alienation. Lukács's book presenting this Hegelianized interpretation of Marx was published, as I say, in 1923 and was promptly condemned by the Communist Party of the Soviet Union as an idealist heresy. After Hitler came to power, Lukács, who had then been living in Germany, fled to the Soviet Union where he delivered a public recantation of his book. This was 1934. This was after those early works had been already been published, which in fact confirmed entirely Lukács' interpretation of Marx. The further irony is that throughout the 30s, when these books were already in print, and when Marxism was becoming increasingly influential among all Western intellectuals, Marx's early writings remained virtually unknown. And it was not until after World War II and when, when the French existentialists started to rediscover Hegel and Hegelianism that the Hegelianized Marx, the young Marx, began to emerge and in fact emerged so successfully that he completely overshadowed the so-called mature or classical Marx. The Marx that is of the Communist Manifesto and Capital, the Marx of Lenin and Stalin and Trotsky and Mao. Let me go back then to Hegel, the fount of Marxism. And let me start with the usual apologies for brevity, superficiality, and so on, which are more than pro forma in this case. Because taking on Marx and Hegel and the young Hegelians in between all in one talk is, is rather uh, foolhardy. I'll focus then only on a single idea, of, uh, on just a few ideas and I'm afraid deal with those uh, all too hastily. The main idea that links Marx to Hegel is the idea of history. This seems so trite, so unexceptional, that one, one can hardly take note of it now. Uh, it hardly seems to merit co comment. It is hard now in our thoroughly historicist age to appreciate how novel how truly revolutionary Hegel's philosophy of history was. We talk of the Kantian revolution, Kant's making of man, the knower, the center of reality, rather than the thing that is known, that is the objective reality. But we rarely talk of the Hegelian revolution, Hegel's making of history, the center of reality finding the secret of the universe in the enduring nature of, not of being, but in the evolving process of change. We have so completely assimilated that historical consciousness that we are hardly aware of how profoundly it has affected our thought. To be sure, everyone had always known about history, about the transient, the ephemeral, the uh, flux of time and change. What Hegel did was to find meaning in history, not the petty meaning that attaches to petty events and that all of us are familiar with in our normal lives, but some grand integral meaning, a meaning for the whole of history. Hegel's philosophy of history opens, quote, the subject of these lectures is the philosophy of world history. Not he goes on philosophy itself, not history itself, not even world history itself, but the philosophy of world history. Quote, the sole thought which philosophy brings to the treatment of history is the simple concept of reason. That reason is the law of the world and that therefore in world history, things have come about rationally. Earlier philosophers located reason in philosophy, in the rationality of being, 
the essential enduring nature or condition of man. Hegel located it in history, a history that thinks itself, as it were, into existence, that realizes its own rationality gradually in the course of time, from one period to another, from one people to another, until it is fully realized in the end of history in universal history. Hegel's reason, the reason that reveals itself in history, is not our familiar common sense human reason. It might be helpful to think of it as capitalized or uppercase reason in contrast to lowercase human reason. In German, of course, all nouns are capitalized, so this is entirely my invention and Hegel bears no responsibility for it. But I think it is helpful to make that distinction, at least for us in this in a very different kind of philosophical tradition. The human faculty of reason is the reason of cause and effect, that reason br that, uh, the reason that people bring to the ordinary events of their lives. Hegel's reason is a cosmic reason, the reason inherent in the world, the reason that makes world history meaningful. Meaningful not in the sense that it makes it comprehensible to ordinary human beings, although it does that as well, but rather that it makes history meaningful and rational in and of itself. Hegel prided himself on being the first philosopher to expose, to explain the reason in history. And by the same token, he said, the last philosopher, because in doing so, he revealed the ultimate truth, the essential rationality of history. This is not to say that Hegel believed that everything that happens in history is rational, although this is the charge commonly brought against him. He is accused of claiming that everything that is, is rational, therefore legitimate, thus legitimizing the whole of the existing social order, the status quo. The actual world, he is quoted as saying, is as it ought to be. The rest of the sentence is rarely quoted. The actual world is as it ought to be, and Hegel went on, the truly good the universal divine reason is the power capable of actualizing itself. Capable of actualizing itself, not already actual. If reason, that is capital R reason, were already actual in history, then history would be at an end. We would truly be in that state that we've heard so much about recently, the end of history. Hegel's point is that reason unfolds slowly, gradually, in history. At any given time, reason is only partially, partly present in history. The real, the actual, is only partially and potentially rational. It is by means of the dialectic of history, the dynamic of history, that, the gradu that, that reason gradually realizes itself in history. Hegel's dialectic d depends upon the, du the double meaning of history. And here too the device of capitalization is useful. On the one hand there is lowercase history, the familiar empirical factual history, what Hegel calls the actuality of history. And there is also uppercase history, history as it is penetrated by reason. History which is rational and purposive. Hegel does not deny the reality of lowercase history. On the contrary, he insists upon it. For it is only through this empirical, factual history that rational history can emerge. I just came across this quotation the other day. I can't resist reading it to you. Hegel once said that reading the newspaper is the morning prayer of the realist. It is the realist's way which is to say the philosopher's way of invoking reality every day, of keeping himself very much in touch with reality. And it's that kind of reality, that kind of actuality that, that Hegel was very respectful of, even as he supposed that there was this larger 
capital R reason that was always informing history. Lowercase history, history is experienced by human beings in their daily lives, Hegel tells us, is full of unreason, violence, chance, contingency, confusion. It is here that men act out, he says, their needs, their passions, their interests, their characters, and their talents. And it is by means of this history, that is lowercase history, and only by means of this history, not by divine intervention or by some uh, uh, providential foresight or anything of that sort, that reason, capitalized reason, appears as the end product of history. Nothing, he says, nothing happens, nothing is accomplished, except by particular individuals seeking the satisfaction of their particular wants. And this is what he calls the cunning of reason. Reason using passion and interest to achieve its ends, using the particular to realize the universal. In pursuing their own passions and interests, individuals unwittingly produce results beyond their immediate purposes. Quote, they gratify their own interests, but something more is thereby accomplished which is latent in the action, though not present in their consciousness, and not included in their design. Some individuals, world historical individuals, as he says, further the course of, of reason, reason in history, more directly and more dramatically. But even they are only the unwitting instruments of reason. They bring history to a new stage of development without knowing what they are doing. They think they are acting in their own best interests, but they contain within themselves an unconscious inner spirit that germinates with them, within them and finally bursts forth like a kernel in a shell, a germ, he says, in the womb of time. It was thus that Caesar, seeking only to promote his own interests and power, achieved a different and higher end. Quote, in accomplishing his originally negative purpose, the autocracy over Rome, he, at the, he that is Caesar, at the same time, fulfilled the necessary historical destiny of Rome and the world. Now, if you're all floundering in these abstractions, there's more, I'm afraid, and worse to come. I'll spare you most of them, but there's one I cannot avoid, and that is the concept of freedom. For the reason that unfolds in history, the idea or spirit that's imminent in history, is, Hegel says, the consciousness of freedom. And here we come upon another common misreading of Hegel. One of his editors sums up Hegel's thesis about the evolution of freedom. Quote, in past Oriental civilizations, one was free. In classical antiquity, some were free. And in modern Germanic and Anglo-Saxon civilizations, all are free. In fact, what Hegel says is, quote, Orientals do not yet know that spirit which is to say man as such is free. And because they do not know it, they are not free. They only know that one man is free, but for this very reason, such freedom is mere caprice. The consciousness of freedom first arose among the Greeks, and therefore they were free. But they and the Romans likewise only knew that some are free, not man as such. This not even Plato and Aristotle knew. For this reason, the Greeks not only had slavery, but their freedom itself was partly an accidental, transient, and limited flowering, and partly a severe thraldom of human nature. Only the Germanic peoples came through Christianity to realize that man as man is free and that freedom of spirit 
is the very essence of man's nature. Hegel is talking not about the evolution of freedom, but about the evolution of the consciousness of freedom. He does not say that in Oriental civilizations one person is free, that in antiquity some were free, and that in modern times uh, all men are free. What he does say is that in Oriental civilizations men knew that only one was free. In antiquity they knew that some were free. And in modernity, they finally realize that man as man is free. Just as reason is paramount in history, so for Hegel, consciousness is paramount in freedom. And so too, as Havel reminds us, consciousness precedes being. For Hegel, consciousness is the primary determining condition of our being, that is, of our existence. Unlike Marx, for whom being, which is to say material existence, preceded and determined consciousness. Which brings us to Marx, or rather to his predecessors, the young Hegelians. For it was they, not Marx, who first stood Hegel on his head. Hegel was in a sense a victim of his own dialectic. His thesis was confronted with its antithesis in the form of young Hegelianism, out of which emerged a new synthesis, Marxism. What is so fascinating about this story, or one of the fascinating things about it, is how rapidly this movement of thought took place. Trotsky used to say to those tempted to deviate from the party line, if you say A, you have to say B. If you say B, you go on to C, and before you know it, you're at Z which is to say you start by being a revisionist and you end up by being a counter-revolutionary. And so it was with these young Hegelians. Each deviation seemed to generate another and more, more dramatic deviation until finally the entire beautifully articulated structure of Hegelianism lay in ruins. Hegel died in 1831 leaving behind two rival groups of young Hegelians, the left Hegel young Hegelians and the right young Hegelians. And these, by the way, were the terms that were used at the time and that were applied by them at the time. If we now pay attention only to the left young Hegelians, it is because one must admit they were simply more interesting than the right, and also because it was they who led to Marx, and it is Marx whom finally we are interested in. The traditional distinction between the two is that the right accepted the content of Hegel's thought, reason and history, and the state as the embodiment of reason, while the left accepted the form, that is, the dialectic as the agent or the mo motive power, the moving power of history. Another way of differentiating them is in religious terms. The right assumed that Hegel's reason was equivalent to God, and therefore provided a philosophical and rational support of Christianity. While the left took his reason as a repudiation of Christianity, the replacement of re religion and revelation by reason and philosophy. It was, in fact, religion that was the issue that most preoccupied the young Hegelians, the left young Hegelians, as well as the right. Now this seems so, may seem so remarkable that, uh, that many commentators have in fact denied that it was so. Uh, this, after all, was, uh, what, about three quarters of a century after, Hegel, after Voltaire had uh, assured the enlightened world that the last king would shortly be strangled in the entrails of the last priest, or vice versa. I can never remember which is to be, but, but the effect, I think, is the same. Yet at this late date, well after the Enlightenment, the left still felt obliged to make war, not against the priesthood, not against the religious establishment, but against religion itself. The religious battle started in 1835, only four years after Hegel's death, with the publication of David Strauss's Life of Jesus. The book burst like a bombshell throughout literate Europe. 
although in retrospect it seems mild enough. Its thesis is simple. The miracles recounted in the Gospels, including the divinity of Christ, are not literally true, but they are mythically true. They express the myth-making consciousness of the early Christians. They are the primitive communal beliefs that gave meaning, gave reason, to the experiences and history of that community. A few years later, Bruno Bauer took the argument a large step forward by denying not only the miracles and uh, uh, the miracles of, in the gospel and the divinity of Christ, but also the mythical and communal nature of these Christian beliefs. The gospels, he insisted, are nothing more than the creations of individual men expressing their private beliefs. To ascribe to them any mythical or communal meaning, he insisted, is to be insufficiently philosophical, insufficiently rational. Now, both Strauss and Bauer claimed to be Hegelians. Each believed his interpretation to be the true Hegelian one. Feuerbach was the first of the young Hegelians to break with Hegel. In his Essence of Christianity, published in 1841, Feuerbach argued that religion is not only a failure of man's consciousness, as, uh, as uh, Bauer had uh, said, but also a failure of man's humanity, a failure of man to realize himself fully as a man. Hegel's reason, Feuerbach said, is the last rational support of theology because it makes of reason a god, a principle outside of man and superior to man, which man might aspire to, but which he could never completely uh, comprehend or attain. It is necessary, Feuerbach said, to return God to man. And to do that, one has to turn Hegel upside down. It's Feuerbach who actually first used that expression. It is not, Feuerbach said, God who created man in God's image. It was man who created God in man's image. So long as man retains the idea of God or reason or any cosmic purpose outside of, outside of and superior to himself, man will be alienated from his own true being. To overcome that alienation, man has to emancipate himself not only from Christianity, but also from Hegel's reason, from the illusion of any idea, any spirit, any reason outside of himself. The essence of man, Feuerbach proclaimed, is man himself. Man's only religion is the religion of humanity. Man, he said, is the God of man. We have come a long way from Hegel, but not the whole way, for there was more to come. There was, most notably, Max Stirner. Three years after Feuerbach turned Hegel upside down, Stirner turned Feuerbach upside down and convulsed the community of young Hegelians. Stirner's The Ego and His Own is a thoroughgoing denial of any transcendent principle a denial of Feuerbach's man as God as much as of Hegel's reason as God. The religion of humanity, Stirner said, is still a religion. The only reality is the ego, the self, the I, the unique one. Beyond that, there is nothing. No religion, no morality, no community and no truth. Long before Nietzsche, Stirner wrote, as long as you believe in truth, you do not believe in yourself, and you are a servant, a religious man. The ego and his own concludes, I am the owner of my might, and I am so when I know myself as unique. In the unique one, the owner himself returns to his creative nothing, of which he is born. Every higher essence above me 
be it God, be it man, weakens the feeling of uniqueness. All things are nothing to me. That was truly the culmination of young Hegelianism, a nihilism that was the very antithesis of Hegel's rationalism. And this movement of thought, from Hegelianism to Nietzscheanism, or one might, you know, if one wants to identify Stirner, and I think for these purposes one can with Nietzsche, this movement of thought all took place within a single decade and on the part of a very small group of very bright, very bold, very articulate, and very young men. Strauss was all of 27 when his book took Europe by storm, and the others were not very much older. In a sense, Hegel was, resp was responsible for it all. In retrospect, one can see that his thesis was bound to produce its antithesis. His idea of reason and history was so absolute, so intoxicating, that his followers were inevitably tempted to hasten the process of realizing or actualizing that reason in history. And not at the end of history, but right now, in the present. And not as a suprahuman idea, which would never to be totally realizable by man, but as an idea within man and completely realizable by man. By the same token, the freedom that Hegel saw as unfolding gradually in history through the medium of the state, this too the young Hegelians tried to realize in its totality, here and now, and divorced from both history and the state. Stirner, of course, went still further, denying reason itself and asserting a radically individualistic freedom divorced from humanity itself. But it was Hegel, one might say, who was the real revolutionary. By creating a god of reason rather than revelation, he created a Frankenstein of a man-god and finally a godless man. And at this point, and in this milieu, Marx appears on the scene. As intellectual generations are counted, uh, 10 or 15 years to the generation, Marx and Engels were a generation younger than the other young Hegelians. For a brief period, both of them were in fact associated with some of the lesser known young Hegelians, uh, Arnold Ruger, Moses Hess, uh, but they soon broke with this, and by 1845, when Marx was 27, exactly the same age as Strauss when he published his book, Marx and Engels, whom he had already met by this time, wrote together the German ideology, a diatribe, a 600-page diatribe, against Bauer, Feuerbach, and Stirner, a declaration not so much of independence from the young Hegelians as a declaration of war. One can see why the book was never published. It was long, inf infinitely long, repetitive, vituperative, often scatological, accusing the young Hegelians, among other things, of being mired in the dunghill of religion because they were all obsessed with consciousness and self-consciousness rather than with the real world of material conditions and social, which is to say class relations. The Communist Manifesto, written three years later, was Marx's alternative to both Hegelianism and young Hegelianism. Uh, this too, by the way, was a joint production of Marx and Engels. If I speak of it as Marx's, it's only for the sake of simplicity, and also, I think, because it is quite clear that Marx was the dominant author. The Manifesto, even more than the Capital, reveals the essence of Marxism. It also reveals Marx's dexterity in standing Hegel on his head, even while appropriating one of Hegel's main ideas, which is the idea of history. The first striking thing about the manifesto, it is that is, that is not about the Communist Manifesto, is that it is not a manifesto at all in the sense of being a call to action. It is rather a history, 
or more precisely, a philosophy of history. In fact, an anti-Hegelian philosophy of history. In place of reason as a moving force of history, we are given the class struggle. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggle. And in place of the Hegelian epics, defined by the consciousness of freedom, oriental civilization, antiquity, and so on, we now have epics, and Marx uses the same word, antiquity, feudalism, bourgeois society, defined entirely by the mode of production and the ruling class. History then was as crucial to Marx's scheme as it was to Hegel's. For Marx, as for Hegel, history had its own inexorable teleological necessity. The movement of history might be temporarily deflected, but it could never be permanently stayed. The driving force of history was radically different. Where Hegel's history was driven by reason and freedom, Marxist was driven by material production and the class struggle. Where Hegel saw the kernel of spirit bursting through the shell of actuality to bring history to a new stage of reason and freedom, Marx, using an almost identical metaphor, saw the mode of production burst asunder by its own inner contradictions, thus bringing about the inevitable economic and social revolution. Where Hegel relied upon the cunning of reason to further the progress of history, that is reason operating through the passions and interests of individuals, Marx relied upon what might be called the cunning of matter, history progressing by means of contradictions in the material mode of production and therefore the struggle of classes. Unlike Hegel, Marx had no world historical individuals. In fact, he had no individuals at all in his schema. What he had were classes, and above all, he had the proletariat. Now, this raises an interesting question, which I've never seen uh, discussed, but which strikes me over and over again every time I uh, read the manifesto. Why did Marx, addressing himself to the proletariat, speaking on its behalf and in its name, presented in so unattractive a light. The word itself, proletariat, is pejorative, deriving from prolus, meaning offspring. It originally referred to the lowest class of Roman citizen who served the state only by producing citizens, uh, by produce, pardon me, not citizens at all, by producing children. The account of the proletariat in the manifesto is no less pejorative. The proletariat is depicted as not only poor, but getting poorer every day, working longer hours for less wages, sinking deeper and deeper into pauperism and slavery, barely able to, quote, prolong and reproduce a bare existence. Indeed, barely human at all, having become little more than, as, as uh, Marx repeatedly said, a commodity and appendage of the machine. It is not surprising after this to find that the proletariat also lacks all of the moral and, and social qualities one normally attributes to human beings. A sense of law, morality, nationality, religion, culture, family, freedom, individuality. All of these, Marx says over and over again, all of these are bourgeois notions. They do not apply to the proletariat at all. On the subject of family, Marx is especially brutal. There is, he says, a practical absence of the family among the proletariat. What passes as family is little more than public prostitution. Communists, he says, do not have to introduce a community of women since it has existed from time immemorial. The bourgeoisie, when they are not seeking out prostitutes and seducing each other's wives, have, quote, the wives and daughters of the proletarians at their disposal. And finally, and seems to me most brutally, 
all family ties among the proletarians are torn asunder and their children transformed into simple articles of commerce and instruments of labor. This is an extraordinary picture of the class that was to be the bearer, the hero of the revolution. Later Marxists refer to it as the emisceration thesis. The idea that things are terrible and will have to get worse before they can get better. But this is a very abstract and academic way of looking at this very graphic portrait of the proletariat in the manifesto. The question is, why did Marx do it? Why did he depict the proletariat? Not so much as a class apart, but as a species apart. It was not only tactless of him, to say the least, it was demonstrably, visibly untrue. It had never been true. Things had never been that bad. Certainly by 1848, when the manifesto was written, it was less true than ever. For by then, the conditions of the working classes were clearly improving, economically, culturally, even politically. It was not true, but it was necessary for Marx's purpose. It was necessary in order to create a historical schema that was thoroughly deterministic. Only if the proletariat was reduced to its lowest level, to the point of total pauperization and dehumanization, would the revolution be a historical necessity. Not a matter of will or desire or consciousness, but of literal physical necessity. Only at that stage, when the crisis of the proletariat was at its height, when the workers had nothing to lose but their chains, when they could barely sustain and reproduce themselves, and when simultaneously, and this is equally important, it's important that these two things occur at the same time, when simultaneously the crisis of capitalism, brought about by the inner contradictions of capitalism, was at its height, only then, would the revolution or would communism be inevitable? Because communism would then be the product of the real movement of history. And the real movement of history, Marx repeatedly insisted, was what made his system, unlike all previous ones, scientific. It was Hegel who coined the term historical materialism to describe Marxism. There are commentators who argue that the concept was peculiar to Engels, that Marx would not have used it or approved of it. I myself find it entirely appropriate. If Hegel, if Hegelianism can be properly de- uh, characterized as historical idealism, and that's n- you know, not a bad shorthand uh, phrase for it, Marxism can surely be properly described as historical materialism. In rejecting Hegel's idealism, Marx rejected not only reason as the impelling force of history, but also freedom. This is another extraordinary feature of the manifesto, the conspicuous absence in it of any idea of freedom. One would have thought that Marx would have invoked that idea, if only for rhetorical effect. He could have condemned capitalism for depriving the proletariat of freedom, the freedom to think and speak and act or believe or disbelieve, to organize, to vote, to be educated, and so on. And he could have made it one of the arguments in favor of socialism that it would give the proletariat the freedom presently enjoyed only by the bourgeoisie. It is a tribute to Marx's honesty that he did not do this. On the contrary, He spurned the idea of freedom. Every reference to freedom in the manifesto, with a single exception that I will come to, is invidious. Freedom, we are told, like family, law, religion, morality, individuality, is a, quote, bourgeois notion, an outgrowth of the conditions of bourgeois production and bourgeois property. Freedom means nothing more than free trade, free selling and free buying. Religious liberty and freedom of consciousness, he writes, merely express the sway of free competition within the domain of knowledge, 
They are not eternal truths, but only the reflection of the social consciousness of previous, of past ages. The one exception, the only positive reference to freedom in the whole of the manifesto appears in the very last sentence, in the description of communism. In place of the old bourgeois society, he writes, with its classes and class antagonisms, we shall have an association in which the free development of each is the condition of the free development of all. Period. End of quotation, end of description of communism. Free development. What did Marx mean by that? The only clue we have is in the German ideology. It is there that Marx gives us a memorable image of a communist society in which everyone enjoys a freedom that is totally unlike any kind of freedom ever contemplated by any bourgeois thinker such as John Stuart Mill. In contrast to bourgeois society, Marx says, where each person is confined to a particular productive role, a communist society, quote, regulates the general production and thus makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize, by which Marx means philosophize, after dinner, just as I have a mind, without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, shepherd, or critic. Now, I myself don't know how a com communist society can both regulate production and leave people free to do exactly as they like every minute of the day. But then I can't imagine a daily regimen in which one might hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, and philosophize after dinner. Can one really, by the way, rear cattle only in the evening? I'm sure that you milk cows in the morning as well. Or for that matter, can one really philosophize after dinner? <laughs> one wonders what the proletariat of Marx's day who were not hunters, fishermen, cattle, rearers, or philosophers, but rather factory workers, what would they have made of this notion of freedom? Where, for that matter, does factory work come into it? Or did Marx intend industrialism, which is, after all, based upon a division of labor, did he intend industrialism to be abolished together with capitalism and private property? It's, it's all very intriguing, very mystifying, and we're told nothing more about it. And one can well understand why Marx not, chose not to dwell uh, very much on this final stage of communism. What is clear, however, is that freedom in the conventional bourgeois sense, the freedom of speech and press and religion and association, had no meaning, no value for Marx except as a strategy in the struggle against capitalism. And so too consciousness had no meaning or value for him. And this too is puzzling at first sight. Why was Marx so insistent upon relegating consciousness, that is ideas, beliefs, attitudes, sentiments, and so on, to the superstructure of reality? So that intellectual production, as he put it, was nothing more than a reflection of material production. By the way, that word production is very characteristic of Marx. He never talks about children except in terms of the production of the family, and he never talks about ideas except in terms of the production of ideas, and therefore you know, really establishing the affinity or the dependence upon material production. Why did he deprive socialism of such a powerful source of support as a belief in ideas? in liberty, or equality, or fraternity, or justice, or natural rights, or whatever. In fact, this mechanistic theory of consciousness produced very serious problems, intellectual problems for Marx. How could he and Engels, both of them indubitably bourgeois, Engels, in fact, was a uh, certified capitalist, a part owner of, of several factories, uh, from the profits of which he supported not only himself, but Marx and his family, how could they have developed a consciousness, an ideology, 
that was not a reflection of their class interests. How, in fact, could they have created Marxism? And how could so many of their bourgeois disciples adhere to an ideology that was at odds with their economic interests and class affiliations? These, however, were minor inconveniences compared with the advantages of a rigorous materialism and determinism which precluded both freedom and consciousness. Freedom and consciousness, ideas about what constituted a free and good society, these were bourgeois notions and hence passé. They were the products, as Marx tells us, of a past age. They were the ideological remnants of the past. It was the future Marx was interested in. And for that, he needed a thoroughly materialistic and historical determinism that was not dependent on the vagaries of men's ideas or on their conscious choices and actions. Marxism did not win converts because of its economic theories about value or surplus value. The economists soon exposed the fallacies of those ideas. Nor did it win converts because of its predictions about the pauperization of the proletariat and the proletarianization of the petty bourgeoisie. The economy itself soon belied those predictions. Nor did it win converts because of its insistence on the class struggle and revolution. Even Marxist revisionists had to give up some of those ideas. Nor did it win converts because it was full of compassion for human suffering, for the suffering of the proletariat. Marx himself had nothing but contempt for those who were interested in the proletariat merely, as he said in the manifesto, as the suffering class. Marxism won converts because it promised to win the future. And it promised to do so because of this potent combination of materialism and historicism. This is what Marx meant by the real movement of history, a movement brought about not by individuals pursuing their ideas and ideals, but by a class that necessarily, inexorably, even unwittingly, would bring about the revolution. This is what made Marxism, he was convinced, unlike all previous varieties of socialism, scientific. And this was its assurance of success. Nothing is as, as, as seductive as the assurance of success. It is sometimes said in criticism of Marxism that its historical determinism was its weakness. Why fight for communism if its success was assured? Why join, or for that matter form, a communist party if the proletariat itself by its very existence would bring about the revolution? But these are the arguments of logicians. Psychologists and politicians know that the bandwagon is the most effective political vehicle, that nothing works like success. What Marx called the real movement of history, we sometimes call the tide of history or the wave of the future. Communism, the classless society, makes its appearance for Marx only at the end of history, but the movement in, uh, for it is in the present. And it is the promise of that utopian end that justifies everything that happens in the present, all the harsh necessities of the present, the bloodshed and strife inherent in the class struggle and revolution, the tyranny and brutality inevitable in that intermediate stage of socialism that Marx called the dictatorship of the proletariat. To win the future, Marx was prepared to lose, to forfeit man, to abolish man, as C.S. Lewis said. Hannah Arendt once said that no thinker ever reduced man to a commodity as totally as Marx did. Adam Smith made of labor only a measure of value, a measure of exchange. Marx made of labor the source of value and then proceeded to define man entirely in terms of his relation to the means of production. Even the term proletariat, in, in, in place of the usual familiar 
contemporary terms, workers or working classes, is invidious. Workers are individuals, and working classes reflects the plurality of groups that, in fact, was in existence at the time. And both of them preserve the dignity associated with the word work. Proletariat, on the other hand, denies the individuality of human beings and even the plurality of classes, recognizing only a single, undifferentiated class, a class that do does not share a common human nature, what the Marxists now call a generic human nature, with other classes, a class that is totally distinctive, defined simply as an instrument of production. The Marxist combination of materialism and determinism is fatally anti-humanistic. It denies a consciousness, a mind, that is independent of material conditions. It denies a will and volition that are capable, perhaps, at least on occasion, of shaping the course of history. It denies an individuality that is not reducible to class. It denies both the idea and the reality of freedom, a freedom that is something more than the bourgeois freedom to buy and sell. It denies a morality that transcends class interests. And it denies the spirituality of man, spirituality in either the philosophical Hegelian sense or in the more orthodox religious sense. By putting Marx back into the Hegelian context, one can see what it meant to stand Hegel on his head. Paraphrasing the memorable saying of Freud, where the id was, there the ego shall be, one may say of Marx, where spirit was, there matter shall be. The so-called humanistic Marx celebrated by neo-Marxists, is an oxymoron. It is, in fact, an insult to Marx, for it belies everything he sought so hard to achieve. As Yogi Berra, or was it Sam Goldwyn, would have said, if Marx were alive today, he would be turning in his grave. Thank you. Comments, questions? Yes. How did Hegel understand himself in regard to his understanding of history? <clears throat> How did Hegel personally account for his apparent, as it were, revelation that he was able to succeed in saying something nobody had up till his own time? Well, well you see, he didn't have the, quite the same problem that Marx did since he was able to perhaps regard himself as a kind of world historical individual who was able to break through the categories of his time. And he did in fact confront that very question when he called himself the last philosopher. He had finally revealed the truth about history and in a sense that was the end, not of history, because history still had to work itself out, but it was the end of philosophy. How oh, in consideration that he was this particular man how could this particular man be a conduit for that kind of revelation? Doesn't that contradict his own thinking? No, I think not, because he did allow for man to break through, for some men to contain that inner spirit, that kernel, that would generate, that would, would burst forth and, and, and permit a new stage of history to be uh, achieved, just as Caesar or Napoleon or Alexander did in exactly the same way, except that he was a world historical individual so that he did not call himself this. Uh, he was immodest to call himself the last philosopher, but he was not quite immodest enough to call himself a world historical individual, but I think he would have thought of it that way. It was possible in his schema to break through, you see, this movement of history. You could never break through it entirely, but you could always break through it partially, and any one individual 
was capable of moving history along in a very significant way. Yes. I'm intrigued by your explanation for the attraction of Marxism, the, this idea that it was going to succeed and so people wanted to get on the bandwagon. Do you think that's why so many um, you know, contemporary Marxists, uh, in, particularly in religious and academic circles, I mean, do you think that's why they're still attracted to Marxism? And do you think there'd be any rethinking of it when you see that it's not succeeding? Well, the wonderful thing about you know belief or about a fanatical belief, which is what you know a great many Marxists have had, academic Marxists especially, uh, is that it never gets belied by the evidence. That is, you know, this is the, this wonderful sociological theory of cognitive, cognitive dissidence. Reality is over there, and your ideology is here, and the two seem never to uh, <laughs> impinge upon each, each other. I think it is true that it is not only the idea that they are going to succeed, although I dare say this is a little part of it, uh, but it is also the idea that the movement of history that they are associating with them, themselves with, the belief in history, that end of history, is inevitable. And that's a very powerful argument. It makes it very much more real. Some, and it's not only inevitable, but it's that combination of historical inevitability or historical necessity and material determinism that makes it such a potent combination. Because it's the material basis that makes it seem much more real, more uh, fundamental, more compelling than Hegel's reason or spirit or idea. This is rooted in reality. I and mean, this has to do with you know, the means of production and so on. This, after all, Marx develops this theory at the time when the Industrial Revolution is. Uh, a very dramatic event in men's consciousness. So it seems terribly real. You impose that reality on this historical reality, the real movement of history, as Marx says, and you have a very powerful combination. And then you have another factor, maybe I, made, I didn't emphasize this enough, and that is the religious, this is all part of a, of a truly religious structure of thought. I mean, however materialistic it was, it was as Marx's thinking, Marxism itself, was every bit as eschatological as any religion or as Hegelianism. There was that end of history, and that end of history was inevitable, in some very distant future perhaps, but inevitable. But that end of history gave legitimacy and validity to everything that happens within history. And so on top of, of that, of, of the uh, necessity that is given to history by this historical movement of history and by the material infrastructure, as Marx says, of history, you have this large religious structure which, makes, which, which gives that, that final purpose and destiny to history. And I think that's, there's a kind of, uh, you know, a, a threefold um, uh, you know, combination there that's almost irresistible. At the, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that uh, Lukács published a book in 1923 in which he related Marx to the young Hegelians. And then you said the Marx Lenin Institute uh, published some writings which were not published before then. And then after he fled, that was like 32. And then when he fled Germany, he recanted in Moscow. And I think, you, I think the implication was that his recantation was really wrong, that the, the publication of 32 reinforced his dissertation. Mm -hmm. And towards the end, I think you said that the current neo-Marxism is a perversion. It was turning Marx in itself. Now, my question is, are the current neo-Marxists, are they rediscovering Lukács' thesis or Lukács' recantation? Oh, no, Lukács' thesis. What they are doing is they are rediscovering exactly that young Marx, that neo, that Hegelianized Marx that Lukács had discovered then. They needed that Marx, in fact. The Marx, by this point, we are now, to, this has been going on for 20, 25 years. The Marxists needed some new Marx. The old Marx had been totally discredited. I mean, nothing had worked out the way it was supposed to have worked out. All the predictions, all the theories had been belied. 
the proletariat the proletariat had not become more pauperized on the contrary they had become more bourgeoisified uh, the petty bourgeoisie had not become proletarianized on the contrary they had grown in strength you know one the labor theory of value the theory of surplus value the withering away of the state and you know, just wherever you touch as the crises of capitalism they were visibly not getting worse what was getting worse were the crises of socialism so the one thesis after another was being uh, belied and they needed a new kind of Marx and they founded found this Marx in the young Marx and so they suddenly discovered a Marx or they invented a Marx uh, that had room for consciousness, allowed for a certain amount of freedom, uh, permitted a kind of culture, you know, had some use for uh, cultural concepts and so on. It was quite a new Marx and totally, you know, divergent from the old classical Marx. In fact, in the manifesto, in that final kind of appendix uh, to the book when he quarrels with all the other varieties of socialism. He criticizes the so-called true socialists of Germany, who are the remnants of the young Hegelians, for adhering to these old Hegelian ideas about the alienation of humanity and the redemption of humanity and so on. All of this, says Marx, is nonsense. Well, but the neo-Marxists the neo have now rediscovered alienation and consciousness and all the rest. They're rediscovering a young Marx that, that actually believed in these things. Why, why is, is that less valid than the so-called classical Marx? It, it's not less valid if that's what you're saying. If you are saying what I am now calling Marxism is the Marx of 1843 and 1844, that would be fine. I would have no quarrel with that. But you can't really, in, in view of, of all that has happened since then, in view of the fact that the Soviet Union has professed to, to embody in its own institutions and so on the Marxist ideology, in view of you know, all of the thinkers, all of the you know, statesmen and so on, who have professed to adhere to Marxism, which is not this Marx of 1843 or 44. It is you know, rather specious to be doing that. In fact, they use both, you see, because they call upon the, new, upon the early Marx when it's convenient, and then they call upon the late Marx, who so it isn't as if they discard the late Marx. They want it both, well, they want it both ways. They want the hard-headed materialism of the late Marx, but also they want some play, some room for consciousness and so on. Michael Harrington, in his book on Marxism, starts out by saying, I think it's either in his preface or his introduction or very early in the book, he says, People will quarrel with this book. They will tell me that I'm not being systematic about my use of Marxist sources and so on. I regard as Marxism anything that I choose to call Marxism. I will quote from the early Marx, I'll quote from the later Marx and so on. This is my Marxism. This is what I call Marxism. Now, some of the other neo-Marxists aren't quite as candid, but in fact, that's, that is what they're doing. I would have no objection if they said, we are Marxists of the 1843-1844 vintage. But they want to do more than that. They want to have all of the prestige and all of the power of the late Marx as well. The late Marxists have to qualify their Marxism also, though. Yes, that's true. That's quite true. Sidney Hook, for example, absolutely refused to take the early Marx seriously. I mean, he had no patience with all these neo-Marxists, as I've called them. Uh, he said, I know what Marxism is. Uh, Marxism was what Lenin thought it was, and what Blachanov thought it was, and what Trotsky thought it was, and so and what I thought it was all of those years. That's the Marxism we all acted upon. That's Marxism. They're playing games now. Marx himself, by the way, totally, well, I, I think I mentioned this, totally repudiated that early Marxism. He said that's all Germanic nonsense. And he was talking about his own works when he was doing this. No, he didn't say that. He was criticizing the true socialists of 1848 and thereabout. He did, uh, I think, though, that if he had been actually confronted with his early works, he might have. Uh, Engels did, when Engels refused to republish Marx's early works. That's what he was saying. That's an old story. Nobody's interested in that. It's no longer true. We went beyond that. Yes? Um, how do you account for the fact that philosophers like Sidney Hook, who were familiar with the real Marx, uh, nevertheless interpreted him as a humanist and a pragmatist. 
I have a lot of problems with that. Um, we, Sidney Hook and I have argued over many, many, many years about exactly this point. Sidney Hook insisted that Marx was not only human, he was kind of social, he made Marx into a kind of social democrat. Now, he wrote that book towards the understanding of Karl Marx when? 1933 was it published? Uh, and he never revised it. Now, I don't mind his not revising it, but he actually republished it. What, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, something like that. And he, uh, I can't remember now whether he wrote a new introduction or not, but I, I think he did not. I think he was perfectly content to let it stand. This was one of his pieties. Now, who am I to argue with that? But it's quite, I can't account for it. Except to say that in 1933, this was a not unfamiliar conception of Marx. You know, this was the period when all those pilgrims were going to the Soviet Union. And I now, my Sidney Hook was not one of those, by the way. I mean, there's no question of that. Sidney Hook always differentiated between Marx and Lenin. Great big gap between the two. And those of us who argue that, in fact, Leninism made important revisions in Marxism, but, but that, you know, there was not that huge gap, there was not a qualitative difference, uh, Sidney never accepted that. Go. Professor Himmelfarb, I'd like to thank you for that thoroughly absorbing lecture. We will have a reception uh, following uh, immediately in the next room. We will reconvene on uh, June 12th when uh, Werner Danhauser will lecture on If God is Dead, Is Everything Permitted? Thank you all very much. concludes Professor Gertrude Himmelfarb's lecture entitled From Hegel to Marx. We invite you to join us this Saturday for our coverage of Debate 92, a symposium on presidential debates. That's Saturday at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 7.30 Pacific. Coming up in a few moments, Charles Keating, chairman of the American Continental Corporation, and his views on the savings and loan industry.